Chapter 5 Chapter 5 By the Hair of His Chinny Chin Chin Alex Metcalf sat on the bench in the visitor's dugout at Dictionopolis's centrally located center field, take, talking with his teammates about the Cyclones' come-from-behind win against the Chicks. Only Dorothy and Button Bright were missing. After you were thrown out, Dorothy said we were shorthanded, so she put me at first, Jack Pumpkinhead said. I suppose because I'm long-handed. It certainly ain't because you're long in the smarts department, said Briar Rabbit. I never thought about you being down to eight players, said Alex. How'd you manage? Jack played a wide first, Briar Rabbit played a wide third, and I covered all the ground in between, Toad explained. That's quite a lot of real estate. It was nothing for old Toad. You should have seen me. I danced to my left, I leaped to my right, I corralled everything that came my way. Well, not everything, Scraps said. Toad shrugged. Seventy-five percent, perhaps. Tick-tock whirred and clicked like an adding machine. Thirty-two point six percent, actually. The point is, Toad said quickly, no one could have done better. He nudged Alex. I came up two places in the overnight polls, too. Ooh, seventh, Briar Rabbit said. You got about as much chance of getting elected as we do of winning this tournament. Alex was more than a little tired of Briar Rabbit sniping. Hey, ears, he said. Did you remember to bring the bucket with the curveballs in it? Briar Rabbit sat up. The what? The bucket with the curveballs. Oh, don't tell me you forgot. How's Dorothy supposed to strike anybody out if she can't throw a curveball? Nobody told me to bring no bucket, Br'er Rabbit said. Tick-Tock frowned and put up a brass finger to interject, but Toad cut him off. Oh, oh yes, I distinctly remember Dorothy telling you to bring them. She'll be spitting needles if they're not here when she gets back, Scraps told him. Br'er Rabbit looked around, worried. Well, Alex asked. You gonna sit there all day and wait for her to come back and notice there's no curveballs? Briar Rabbit hopped off the bench and left at a gallop, running straight into Dorothy as she came into the dugout. Where are you going? She asked him. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I forgot to bring the curveballs. I was just going. Alex, Toad, and Scraps burst into laughter. Pinkerton, perched on top of the dugout, snickered with them. Briar Rabbit's ears flattened as he realized the others had made a fool of him. Get back in the dugout, Dorothy told him. But what about the curveballs? Jack asked. Don't worry about it, Stretch. I'll explain later, Alex told him. He turned to Dorothy to laugh about the joke and noticed she'd been crying. Kansas, you okay? Alex asked. Dorothy took a deep breath and the team got quiet. Toad, I'm going to need you to play two positions again today, she said. Deep short and short left. Pinkerton, I need you to shift to left center. Scraps, you'll need to play right center. Alex did the math. She was covering for an empty left field. Wait, where's Button Bright? Did you kick him off the team? No. He's gone. It was like somebody unplugged the Cyclones. Dorothy stared at her ruby and silver cleats. Toad sat and clasped his webbed hands. Tick-tock slumped. Even Br'er Rabbit's ears drooped. Alex still didn't get it. You mean he quit? Dorothy shook her head. Not now, Alex, okay? To the rest, she said, game's about to start. Pinkerton, you're up first. Alex still didn't get what was going on with Button Bright. He stood in the middle of the dugout, waiting for someone to help him understand, but no one would meet his eyes. Okay, fine, whatever, Alex said. If this dream was supposed to mean something, he was totally lost. He was ready to wake up anyway. Their opponents this time were a team of pigs, all wearing red and white striped uniforms and red hats with the letter P on them. Pinkerton led off with a drive up the middle, but the pig in center came dashing in and caught the ball in his teeth on a dive. Alex whistled to himself. <whistles> That's some pig. Toad hit next. The pig on the mound practiced ballerina steps until her teammates told her to get on with it, and she struck Toad out without looking. He came back to the dugout, shaking his head. I do believe these poor kind players are going to prove a handful today, he told his teammates. 
Nobody had anything to say to him, though. Not even Briar Rabbit. All the spirit of the last game's bench-clearing fight was gone. Dorothy was still playing to win, though, and she stroked a single through the infield to keep the first inning alive for Alex. He didn't know where Button Bright was, or why nobody would talk to him about it, or when this dream was finally going to end, but all he could do was play along until he woke up. The home plate umpire was a boy in a dirty white wolf costume, about half Alex's age. Alex recognized him from a picture book he'd loved as a kid. You're the one who made a fool out of the big bad wolf, aren't you? The boy asked him. Yeah, Alex said. Talking about the wolf was something else he was tired of. Had a pretty good laugh at him afterward, I'll bet. No, look, it was an accident. I bumped into him. It's no big deal. But then you tried to help him up. The scariest storybook in Ever After, and you just offered him a hand. Now that was funny. Hey, this little piggy is ready to play ball, the catcher interrupted. Rah! The boy snarled. Be quiet or I'll eat you up. I'm with the pig. Can I just hit? I want to know why you weren't scared. Look, I didn't know he was some big monster, all right? I didn't know I was supposed to be afraid of him. Maybe next time I'll be scared. Maybe next time he'll eat you up, the boy said, but his voice grew deeper and meaner. He started to swell and grow, his white wolf costume ripping away to reveal a brown wolf costume underneath. Not a costume, Alex realized. A real wolf. A wolf in wolf's clothing. The pig catcher squealed and ran, and the crowd behind home plate screamed and stampeded for the exits. Alex held his ground while the wolf grew twice as big as him. Still not afraid of me, the big bad wolf bellowed. You're not the worst nightmare I've ever had, Alex told him. Maybe not, the wolf said, grinning, but I'll be your last one. Alex raised his bat like a sword and charged, taking the wolf by surprise. Yeah! he cried, swinging. Clang! His bat hit a lamppost. Alex stepped back, surprised. The lamppost crumpled and bent in half. Humph! said a woman, pushing past with a baby carriage. Vandals! Alex blinked. He wasn't on the baseball field anymore. His dream had finally shifted. He was standing on a little footbridge outside a massive white-columned building decorated with banners and balloons. He still had his bat in his hand, though, and someone had her arms around him. That person let him go, and he turned. Dorothy. What? How? I grabbed you and jumped out of there with the cleats, she told him. He looked down at her ruby and silver shoes. She jumped out of the stadium. I can click my heels and go anywhere, remember? No place like home and all that. She leaned back against the bridge, railing to catch her breath. Cripes. I hope people aren't forgetting. Where are we now? Alex asked. The Ever After Exposition Hall. We passed it on the way into town. It was the first place I could think of. Crowds poured through a door to the main building, and Dorothy grabbed Alex's hand and pulled him along to follow them. We have to keep moving. The wolf is the best tracker in all of Ever After. What were you thinking going after him like that? What was I supposed to do, let him eat me? No, but you could have run like any sane person. Wait, what about everybody else? We have to go back for them. The wizard will have magicians there already. Besides, the wolf could have attacked everybody long before he did. He was waiting for you. Come on, we've got to hide. A stuffed toy bear in a security guard uniform saluted them as they went inside. Welcome to the exposition, 